Start. Ready for some exciting good stuff? Yes. Yeah? Are we? I'm a winner <laughs> success. So okay, good. Well, let's start there. So, <laughs> wins or successes? We want to hear. Two under contract yesterday. One day. Awesome. Give her a hand. Oh, good job. <laughs> I might give her a hand and they're all like, no, we hate her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my first two, because the other two both fell apart, so now it's like these two cares. The yeah, one's a cash buyer, so I have nice. good feelings about them. And then the other one, um, she was approved for like $80,000 more than the house she picked. Oh. So I feel like she'll be good, but. Oh, cool, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, maybe after today, you'll, you'll have a better idea. I have a question about that as well. I can't okay. um, So, when you're talking about a cash buyer and someone that's getting approved for like FHA and conventional, can you kind of give me just like a quick explanation of what the difference is? Because can you just, so if it says cash, why can't you just get it to be FHA and just, or just FHA won't approve for it? Or? If it's, well, if it's cash, yeah. then there's no loan involved. It's just oh, it's, so it's like me walking up to you and saying, "How much did you want for okay. for that?" and pulling out my wallet. So they won't even. Deal so with there's no loan at all on that. Which is a little different. So and then as far as FHA and conventional, great questions because today Dale's going to be teaching all about mortgage stuff. Oh, okay. So uh, he can hit on some of that. So yeah, but yeah, typically. So on cash though, one of the things just let me hit on that while we're talking. In terms of on a cash deal, when somebody says they're paying cash, always make sure you get a proof of funds, did you? Yeah, she showed me her bank account and I was really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> she was That's like she was like awesome. I think she had two hundred thousand in it, the house is one seventy and she was just like, I have this much money. I'm like, You're good. Yeah. You can get So this and typically on that I ask them to give me a copy of that and mark out any um, now if, if, how much is the house? One seventy. One seventy. So I probably would, in that scenario, probably what I would say is I would want, I would ask her to, and you got the offer accepted, so this probably doesn't apply now. But typically, I would have said, have your bank write a letter to me, just saying you have funds in excess of one hundred and seventy thousand, so that we can give it to the bank, or to the student, to the seller. Because if 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 I'm the seller though, and you give it, if let's say our list price was one eighty, and you offered one seventy cash. But you give me a copy of the bank statement that shows 200, I'd be like, oh. well, you can afford 180, then pay the 180, you know? So, oh, that's anyway. crazy. We offered um, 100 above list because they had three other three other offers that all come in the same day. Oh. Yeah, wow. so I was like, well, we're cash, so we should be better. And I wanted to offer lower. And then I was talking to everybody around me, and they're all like, no, you have to offer at list price to get yeah, it. I would say that probably was a smart move. So, so we did that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. Awesome. That's Congratulations. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to get excited like in one and a half weeks because then it'll be closing. Yeah, see, that's the other advantage to cash is it can close. Like, as soon as you do your inspections, you can close. It was so. built in 1901. Cool. So, I'm worried awesome. about the inspections, but we'll see. Yeah. Awesome. Good job. Good. Who else? Wins or successes? What good things? Nothing. I think she has enough for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> that was good enough. Yeah, that was good. It's been a long time. All right. Well, so uh, any other just um, general questions that you want me to answer before uh, I turn it over to Dale? And Dale's going to. So, Dale Money is here, which I'm like, what a cool name for a loan officer, right? Dale Money. So, <laughs> uh, is that just me? That's me. I know when he told me that, I was like, like Money is Dale Money. Yeah, I know. That yeah. was cool. I think that's it. Awesome. Uh, one ahead. more question. Yeah. Because I seen it on a, a radio ad yesterday, and it, it was a guy talking about he had a whole marketing plan to show you how to flip houses and, and make any money off of investments. Can you give me? He's laughing at you back there. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, go ahead. How, can you give me like a, a quick little another one, quick little summary of? I mean, how how do you even do that? Is you just Get you buy a house, you rent it out, and build equity, and then sell it. Or? Well, so that's one option. <laughs> Typically, that's probably not what they're talking about. What right. they're talking about probably was saying, you go out and buy a house that is undervalued, or you go out and buy one that you then go and rehab it and then turn around and sell it. I, I mean, I don't know right. what they were were saying, but those are the different options. It's a lot of times, uh, in fact, most of the time, it's they want you to subscribe to their. Uh, Education, yeah, which is includes my book, my tapes, my yeah. I'll coach you on, I'll coach you on it, and so forth. That's how they're really making money. I mean, you know, of course, they 
They'll come out and lead. They'll come out and, and he's lead. Had experience with this. I paid a lot of money for one of those this time. They come out and lead you and say, you know, I got all my this money to invest. You know, invest my money, and really all they're doing is they're wanting to get a piece of your life by having you pay a premium for their so-called expertise, which you probably you're going to get that expertise in the cup in one transaction yourself. Yeah. I paid for it. Can do the whole box with me right now. And there's a reason I'm a real estate agent now is because <laughs> it's not what, especially because the market is so hot with that right now. There's so many people doing it. Um, I talked to a guy last week who wanted me to come down to their investment class. They're having down here as an agent to meet people. They wouldn't let me, but um, there was 50 people there. They're twenty-five thousand dollar classes. See, that's what I'm trying to talk about. That's good. They're not. So what they're you should, well, yeah, really? if you're the one teaching the class, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> it's not. They're they're telling you to go drive around and find dilapidated properties, properties that look bad, and then mail those properties and try to get find the owner and try to get them to sell it for forty cents on the dollar of what it would be worth if it's all fixed up and ready to go. Right. Yeah. And and so here's my question: Is <coughs> why would somebody do that? Why would a seller? Why would it, let's say that I owned that house, why would I sell it to you for 40 cents on the dollar if I could turn around and sell it myself and make, now, meaning, I, I, what I don't want you to hear is, I'm, I'm, what I'm, I'm not saying you can't go out and find houses that are beat up and buy them and purchase and make money, definitely can do that, I've done it a number of times, but it's not as easy as they try to make it sound. Yeah, I did it for like six months, we get a lot of money for it, and then nothing. Yeah, I wasn't gonna. Uh, uh, go well, you want to teach it? No, I wasn't gonna teach. It. I'm saying, <laughs> what are some? I mean, I just wanted to kind of see how the process went because if someone else is making money doing it, maybe in the long run, I could see uh, just kind of show. I mean, it doesn't have to be like my focal marketing tool, but maybe it can be something that I just say in one of my scripts. Like, well, if you're looking, you can flip houses. I can show you how as well. Oh, okay. That kind of thing. But I didn't know exactly. I mean, this guy sounded like there was millions of ways to do it. So I, I know one, you know, you buy it, you rent it out, you build equity, you sell it. Or two, you buy a beat down house and flip it. But is there any other ones? Or any other ways? Or is that about it? That's pretty much it. I don't know how you can. I think a million home. ways is how you find it. Not yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Paul. If you've got a pile of cash, you know, I mean, you got to have cash reserves. Because it takes money to lock the deal up. If you've got a source of for uh, capital, great, it happens all the time. The other good option is if you're a contractor and you can effectively uh, you know, sub out all the work that needs to be done to add additional value. But if you're just looking at par values of homes, you know, you can potentially do it, you're gonna have to buy it, you're gonna have to sit on it, rent it out, but it's gonna take cash reserves to do that. Okay. That's all I want to know. And a lot of times, you know, if, if, if in and from the mortgage side, I'm with Citywide, along with Dale. From the mortgage side, it's an investment property. Uh, and you have to finance the deal based upon, or purchase the deal based upon an investment property uh, transaction. Okay. So, anyway, if you want to get started, I got the property. And this We're is happy to else. talk to you about, you know, about that stuff. <laughs> I'll just, in fact, I'll even just let you take it over if you want to start. <laughs> If you'll assume the loan, you can have it. <laughs> All right. So, any other questions? Anything you need help with? Uh, see, you got to have something because you. Got, I, when I say wins or successes, you have no wins or successes. So you need must need questions. Of Do deals ever go like just as planned? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't tell. Okay. See, and usually when they're cash. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, <laughs> no, I've had three deals pushed back two weeks a week. Yeah, well, a so, of different reasons. Yes, some deals do go as planned, but at the same time, there are a number that <coughs> this happens with. And part of it is that's where I guess here's where what I want you to take from what you just asked me is, especially because I know you're calling a lot of for sale buyers, stop and think about that for a minute from the standpoint of why do some why does somebody go for sale by owner? Why do they decide save to money. do? Because they're going to save money, and and what I mean it's it's more than just save money because it's what? It's not that. Oh, it's not hard. It's not, it's not that hard. I mean, you guys, you throw a sign up, you get the thing. I mean, right? Yeah. So part of why I like about the fact of you seeing that is it helps to, helps for you to be able with some conviction to go talk to a for sale by owner and say, 
what are you going to do when this happens? And, and talk about these things. Because for me, here's the thing. Too many times, I think a seller looks at our job as going and finding a buyer. Now, in some respect, I guess that's what it is. I mean, that's what our due diligence form says, right? It's our job. We're training the marketing of real estate. But really, where we earn our money is keeping that deal together and having it. Because why do you think, why, why would we keep typically a buyer and seller apart and have us as agents be the talking rather than just saying, all right, Chris, you're the buyer and Tristan, you're the seller. Let's just have you guys, let's sit down together and and talk through this. Why would we do, why would we not do that? No, I do have a good agent. You know, a lot of times we'll have to do that. Or, you know, maybe they will do things that you couldn't do face to face. Yeah, but why? I don't know. Okay. I'm going through this right now where I have a, a seller and a buyer who know each other and they're talking and they're making deals that are not legal and not okay. Like, they're not, it's not going to work with what they're doing on their end of stuff compared to what their contract has said. And so, like, if we could, we've told them now, talk to us about real estate. You can talk to each other about anything you want, but if it's about this transaction, you need to talk to us first because you're making things that are not realistic. You're making promises to each other that you can't fulfill that is causing issues. They do. They know each other? They do. Oh, know so each other. like friends or anything? Yeah, well, like kind of. He's been, them. yeah, it's more acquaintances. This one guy's been wanting this house. It's a, it's a cabin down in Alberta. He's wanted it for a long time so he's been hitting this guy up all over and now we've got the deal going on so so yeah so for sure that the other piece is you're going to have deals where let's say chris is my buyer where he's saying to me you go tell the seller that if they don't you know and i'm going to and, and and then i go over to the seller and go all right you know i don't go and say it exactly word for word because I, i'm going to go represent him so i'll go get the message across but i'm not going to do it Meaning, sometimes you put that buyer and seller in the same room, they're going to end up hating each other and, and you know, well, I just want to buy your house then or whatever, you know. And and for so part of it is, if you think about it, that's part of why, I mean, real estate and being an agent seems like, which is may even be why you guys, I mean, for me, if I'm honest, part of what brought me into it is, well, it doesn't look like it's that difficult of a job and look how much money you made, right? But then once you get here, you find out, Okay, generating it is is hard for one, but then once you even do, and even um, Abby brought up, you know, even once you have a deal together, sometimes they don't work out, and so part of it is, you know, why we make what we make is because of what we have to do to keep deals together and to to, to put it together and have it work. Oh. Another benefit of having an agent is that you know you have the experience to look for the things that are, that are the unknowns. Um, you have an individual that's buying a home that is it's an old home and you know the agent said you know to the buyer you need to really we need to make sure we check we get these inspections and we need to check the sewer lines and how many how often do you check the sewer line well he made the suggestion to the buyer check the sewer line let's, let's scope it what did they find in it roots roofs and uh, it's it, it, frankly it was all gooped up seven thousand dollar potential liability went back to the seller said hey we got a problem here. either discount the house or you pay for it the seller is going to pay for it because it is uh while it's kind of you know skipping along now and it's it's workable there's clearly it's it's going to be a Contingent liability and a problem. So that's what an agent can do is that they can scope out, see, provide expertise, opinion, observation, and value to your buyer and the seller to ensure that things come together and everybody's a happy camper down the road. If there's no legal litigation which takes place if, in fact, you don't approach those things beforehand. So those tough words, Andy, make you appreciate the ones that are, when you get this cash one, that, that hopefully so it so goes that. quickly. Yeah. So, but that is, I mean, it is kind of just, but so I hope what part of what you take out of this is, oh, yeah. this is why they, and for sale by owner needs you so much more is because, you know, they, they just don't know how to do it and what to do on all these things. Yeah.
Okay, so I was showing this house over the weekend, and it was a foreclosure. No, it was a short sale. And I kind of told them in advance, because they want to move immediately. It's like, this is going to take like maybe up to six months, even though you have cash. But they want to see it anyway. So I had an appointment, and they checked, and it was confirmed. So I get there, and there's kids playing in the lawn. And inside, the, the whole family's like cooking and hanging out. They had all the lights off. And I'm like, hey, were you guys expecting a realtor at 11? Like, oh, yeah, you can just go on through. And my people felt so awkward. Yeah. Like, they didn't want to, like, and then we opened one of the bedroom doors, and I knocked first, and somebody was in there sleeping. Yeah. It was just horrible. Yeah. Oh, yeah it's and not I was good. like, they're never going to sell my house. Yeah. And they don't want them to, because it's a short sale. So, like, why do they want them to yeah. sell it? That is, that is like, they have no, like, they want to keep not paying. So, there you go. There's a good one to go and buy. All right, well, let's get going. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to turn the time over to Dale then. Dale's going to just talk to you about mortgages and stuff, so have a lot of questions for him, and uh, he's going to talk about just the process and things. So I, I don't, what I don't intend for you guys to do is like leave here and like think, oh, now I know how to be a loan officer, but at least understand what goes on, because Typically, what I've found, especially with new agents, is like we turn it over to the loan officer, and then we're like, "How come we can't close as fast as our cash deal?" You know, so he's going to help you understand why. Yeah. I guess so. Anyway, so, so anyway, I've been doing this since uh, probably before a lot of you were born. In 1985, <laughs> I started in the mortgage business in Dallas, Texas. So, so anyway, and then I uh, I do a lot of with, uh, with one of the top agents in the valley, which is also with Century 21 Everest. I've dealt with her since 19, in the early 90s. Her name's Leslie Forbes. You probably know John and Leslie's team upstairs uh, with their daughter, April, and daughter in law. Uh, anyway, so I've been doing lots of loans uh, over the years to try to, um, you, you know, that's the one thing about being an experienced realtor or loan officer, and I'll always refer to loan officers as LO. So, if I start using acronyms or something, just say, well, what's an LTV or what, what did you mean by that? Because I might get off on a tangent and you guys may not know what I'm talking about. So don't hesitate to make it. Anyway, um, so a lot of times you just don't, you know, in the classes that you guys get uh, instructed, there's so many things. Each situation can be its own unique situation. And there's just, it goes on and on of all the experiences. So. You know, good luck in the future with, with handling all those, but try to cover them all. I mean, it's just, it, every, everything's unique. Okay, so probably, um, you know, the other thing you need to know with mortgages, since there's basically uh, the agencies that lend money, which are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those are your conventional loans. Uh, then you have the government loans, FHA, VA, USDA. They pretty much all have, well, they all have their own set of rules, but all of us lenders follow those set of rules. So a lot of times as an agent, you may say, well, Citywide couldn't get it through. Maybe Academy can get it through. I can tell you that 99% of the time, whatever one of us says, most likely the other one will have the same issue because they're all, we all follow these rules and they're, a, I mean, the book is that thick on what you're supposed to do. Now, there can be judgment calls mostly on income and employment history. That's probably where you might get a small difference between lenders. Uh, but most of the time, if one of us can't get it through, um, it's likely the other one can. Now, there are some issues like, uh, let's say, condo litigation, which I just went through a week ago, where, you know, we couldn't do it because there was a lawsuit with the condo. The condo was suing the builders because there was some water damage on and on. I took it to our condo committee and they says, no, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do it. So then, you know, I was a little nervous thinking, well, I wonder if, you know, someone else in town could do it. Uh, and I just heard from yesterday that another lender also had to turn down that same uh, condo. So it, it's comforting for me to know it's good to be in the same boat that way. So sometimes you can get judgment calls, uh, but most of the time when you're dealing with uh, different lenders, we're all going to be pretty much the same. So that's the other thing is you need to be careful with some of these slick LOs, LOs that mean a loan officer or a loan originator, say, oh yeah, no problem, I'll get that through. I mean, yes, you know, be aware. Okay, so as you guys find a buyer, 
Uh, and you're all excited to go take them out or whatever, but what is what is probably the most important question right off the bat that you'll ask them? You probably know what I'm going to say. Have you talked to a lender, right? Or have you been in touch with your lender? Are you pre-approved or whatever? Because obviously you don't want to be spending a lot of your time on someone who's not qualified, obviously. And you probably learned that in your, in your classes and whatnot. Now that can be, even though they can go to a lender, if you're dealing with a flaky lender that says, oh yeah, no problem, you know, we can go up to 300 and here's, you know, a buyer that really can't. So um, it's good to deal with a lender that knows what they're doing. Uh, and you know, the loan officer is probably 80% of what all happens is just on that upfront. In fact, I think it's that first phone call that I um, go through a lot of questions. And it usually it's about a five minute phone call, but that's what, uh, like Leslie, for instance, will text me and say, hey, this guy's expecting your call. This is his number. He, he reached after six. I call him and I say, hey, you got a minute. I got to ask you a lot of questions. And we go through those questions. So I was going to write those down. Kind of the uh, the four, it's like a four legged chair. You got uh, the things that I'll usually ask about. You got employment, um, slash income. Then I'll go, you know, I'll ask about credit history. Which, you know, I'll, I'll have to say that most of the time, people will know. I mean, almost always, they're pretty upfront with me, at least in my experience. You know, they say, oh, I, I have some credit problems. Um, and then a lot of times, their credit's not as bad as they thought. So, um, you never know. It's just always best to check. And, and the downside of checking credit is very little. I mean, you've probably heard, well, an inquiry can hurt my score. Well, yeah, multiple inquiries can. I, I, I had a credit bureau tell me, well, if you can go up to, they said, three mortgage inquiries within a 60-day period, it won't affect your credit because it, it gives someone the shop ability to, to you know, shop around. In fact, uh, so, on that deal, yeah. I had, um, I, I hear that all the time with the new agents is because um, you're concerned or the client's concerned about that. I had one time though that we had um, the person said we wanted to go and re pull it, and when the second person pulled it, the act their credit score actually was higher than when the first person had done it. So I from then on said, if you go use this guy, he always if the credit's higher. <laughs> I'm joking. So if you use data, let your credit score goes up. So, right? <laughs> and you know the reason that can happen, I can tell you, um, you know the, the 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 vendors, the creditors report to the credit bureau. They usually send them the data once a month on the updated balances uh, in relationship um, to to the well, just the, the updated file. Let's say. So a lot of times, what can happen is you can have one lender pull credit, and then it was just five days later that R. C. Willie sent in their tape. Well, they probably don't do tape anymore. But uh, to the credit to, to the three bureaus, which is Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, and update that loan file with, with their RC Willie account. Oh, by the way, they just paid it, paid off the RC Willie account, and that made the score go up. So that's the reason that these scores can jump around. And when you're dealing with a, uh, a marginal credit borrower, boy, those balances can be so important. And what I'm talking about is when you have a revolving account, like credit card, just a Visa with America First, let's say, and let's say the limit is $500. And at the time we checked the credit, the balance was 472. But you might, you might have already paid it off, but remember everything's about 30 days behind with the credit bureaus. Uh, so, I mean, not always 30 days, but it, it usually works out to be, you know, 30 to 45 days before they update that information. So that's why those credit scores can be really driven on what the balances are in relationship to the high balance or the credit limit. And one thing that then I'll tell you that um, once you can get below 40% on a revolving account, uh, that'll usually help the score. If you go above 40%, uh, then that can hurt the score. What I mean by that is the balance. So let's again use, let's say, a $1,000 uh, credit limit. And if you can keep the balance below 375, of 4,000 um, or 40 percent, then hopefully that'll boost the score as opposed to when you go above 40, which hurts. 
people's credit scores can be really, yeah, really important. One, one thing uh, too is interesting. I was working with an individual and trying to help them season their credit out. And uh, there's credit repair agencies out there, but you know that's something that they have to pay for, and we, you know, they don't need to do that. They can work with Dale. They can work with myself to season their credit out. We can give them usually personal coaching on what they can do to lift their credit score. This one gal, she has multiple uh, amounts owing. She says, well, I'm going to work on each one, one by one. And uh, she began to tell me that, that she's been paying a lot on one balance and not paying anything on another. And I said, you know, what you really need to do is go to your creditors and work out a payment plan. And you come to an agreement and you pay a little bit here, a little bit there, but you're always in compliance with your agreement. And that'll make the credit go to school, the score goes up. Trying to pay off one at the expense of another is going to kill you. And, you know, so she's, she realizes that she has to go talk to her creditors and get a payment plan and uh, stay with that payment plan. So everybody gets a little bit based upon the agreement, and that's going to allow her credit uh, score to go up. But, uh, you know, I mean, in theory, hey, yeah, I want to retire that balance, and I want to retire it quicker. And then when I get that one done, I'll go to another one. But in, in the meantime, she's killing herself because she's not paying yeah. the other ones. Yeah, whatever you do, don't well, don't ever uh, coach someone to miss a payment because those late pays, they're, they're probably the one of the biggest killers. You can't repair. Only time can repair using a late pay uh, most of the time. So the basis, <laughs> though, is we can help them. You know, we can, we can help them. If they've got a little bit of thing, a little uh, credit that's gone sideways, we can help them. Yeah. So credit repair is a big part nowadays of, uh, of mortgage lending because you can, there's tools now with the credit bureaus. You can put in, the, it's called like the what if simulator with one of them, where you can, if you have about $3,000, you know, what balances can we pay down where to boost the score an extra 30 points that you need. So credit repair is, and sometimes, uh, you know, it takes three to six months uh, of someone getting prepared to, to be a qualified buyer. Maybe hey, stick with them because, uh, you know, if they, they have the motivation, uh, usually you can eventually get them to be a client and you know, get a sale. Okay, so these are the four things I'll usually ask over the phone. You know, say, uh, you know, my first start off, uh, how long have you been on your job? Uh, two years. I usually go in right in, uh, okay, well, what type of work is it? Because that can have a lot of bearing on what we do as lenders. Uh, if they're a contractor, um, a truck driver, those type, there's certain professions that can can have expenses along with them, also being a realtor. Uh, so, I mean, because you will have your own expenses. And so what's very important is we as lenders can only count income what they report to the IRS. So we had, in fact, we had a truck driver the other day where he said he made 36000 a year, but on a Schedule A, he'd written off, come on, I got that backwards. He showed he'd made 32000 on his W-2, but he'd written off $36,000 worth of expenses. So he's telling the IRS, look, I made thirty-two, but it took me $36,000 to make this thirty-two. I really shouldn't have to pay any, any tax, and sure enough, he didn't, uh, well, at least hasn't been audited yet. <laughs> um, so that could be, uh, so we could use any of this income. So it can be a two-edged sword. I mean, you want to maximize your expenses, have a low tax liability, but when you go to the lender, oh, well, I can't count that much income. So, so it's very important to know, okay, so what type of work is it? Will it be in one of those professions and, you know, um, Trying to think of uh, back here in my note on what are some of the professions that uh, will have 21 or Schedule A expenses besides realtors, commission and pe commission people, salespeople, um, uh, and uh, yeah, contracting. That's mostly it, right? The you know, 2106? Yeah, the 2106 or the so Schedule like truck A. truck drivers, people that are right, like you know, there's a lot of. Uh, I see it more with the truck drivers that are paid for mileage that write off. You yeah, know, they, they can have expenses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, there's uh, sometimes if you got an individual business owner, you got an LLC, 
you know, the good news is I've got my own company. I could, I, you know, I make good money. The bad news is I write everything off because I don't want to handle the tax liability. Um, and that's you guys. That's yeah. uh, <laughs> that's a that's an issue. Um, you know, we have ways of manipulating those numbers to show true income, but uh, individual sole proprietorships or LLCs. Yeah, he's going to get to that. And then also self-employed. Uh, and again, it all comes down to, uh, you know, I'll ask the questions, okay, well, how long have you had the company? Uh, what are you showing your taxes? What kind of profit, what kind of expenses, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, we'll always want to get those tax returns right away on self-employed or commission truck drivers and look at those tax returns. Because like I say, a lot of times they'll write off more expenses to, to reduce their taxes, but then it hurts when you go to get a loan. So, okay, so a lot of, a lot of questions on that first one. Oh, go ahead. So what would you suggest that we do as realtors? Because like I wanted to buy a house like probably in two years, but if I do the LLC, it's not going to show. A pro like what should we do? I you know, I I would just try to be uh, you know your accountant when you say well these are my legitimate expenses. I would just try to do what the IRS allows for the expenses. I mean obviously there's a gray area what can be written off. Uh, a lot of people are real aggressive writing off every little thing that. You know, if you were to get audit, audited by the IRS, I mean, you could owe a lot more taxes. So, you know, hopefully you can just go to an accountant that, uh, that'll that tell you, well, this is what you really should write off and this is what you should show. And then that's what's really probably the true thing that uh, should be the case anyway. And then you just use that income. Um, you know, having been in that situation before, consistency is uh, sustainability, which is consistency, is critical. If you have your own LLC, make sure you're paying yourself a draw or a salary out of that LLC when you write a check. Keep your account separate. You have the LLC account, you got private your individual account. The LLC pays, and it could be two thousand a month, twenty-five, three thousand dollars a month. But you're doing that consistently. It's not five hundred this month, two hundred this month, ten thousand this month. You take. You keep the money in the LLC and you draw a salary off of that and make sure it's consistent and month after month after month. And that is one of the things that is critical in the lending process is that that consistency, that sustainability. Uh, I mean, you can go, you know, pay yourself a lot this month, something this month, nothing this month, but that inconsistency will be a problem for you. But it all well, takes care of what shows on the taxes anyway. So um, how it was distributed during the year won't have a lot to do with us. But it's still good, like you said, to check and think separate and consistent. Now, also, you may ask, well, how long will I need to be a realtor or be commissioned to count to, to, to get a loan? Usually, the rule of thumb is two years. But if you have at least one full tax year, uh, a lot of times the, uh, the automated under underwriting comes back let's say you have you can go 10 percent down and go conventional and you have a pretty good credit score sometimes they'll only require one year so you could be self-employed technically for just one year now when i say one year one full from january to uh, december tax year so it might be usually it'll be a little more than one year uh, of actual employment maybe you'll cover this in the down payment at what down payment threshold or is there that will take away the employment history issue oh good question there was a lot of uh, what we call low income no income uh, no doc loans that used to exist before the big mortgage crash those loans are pretty much gone i think there might be any low doc or was it used to, it used to be about 20 25 percent down you could then get into not having to show income but um, any fannie mae freddie mac or conforming loan you pretty much have to have your good two-year work history and, and a show an income that's documentable. So, you know, I'm pretty sure there's probably some lenders out there uh, that you could find that would be hard money. And, you know, anytime you get into non-conforming, you're going to be paying a higher rate. But you know, if they don't have any first fifty percent, they you could probably find a lender. And instead of getting, you know, a rate that let's say in the high threes or mid high threes, like what we're at now, it might be in the you know mid high fours, but at least maybe they got a home. Yeah. But so you know that would just be one you kind of have to shop around and see uh, if that's those are available. I, I don't I haven't heard of any lately, but things are changing all the time <laughs> in this business. 
So yeah, go around employment and income, asking a lot of questions that way. Um, and then uh, oh, and I'm back to employment. See, there's a lot of different, you know, we go back on a two year work history, but schooling can count, full time schooling can count as a work history. So someone who just graduated, let's say three months ago in the spring, uh, you know, in May, graduated from U of U in finance and they have their first job, we can do a loan for them. Just so that they got, let's say they got an accounting degree and they're an accountant. Or obviously, if they got an accounting degree and they're a realtor, or accounting degree and they're a forklift driver, yeah, no, that's a little bit different. But just so it's kind of related, uh, most of the time you can tie in. So the two-year work history is important. Also, you get a lot of folks that uh, maybe worked for 10 years. Uh, let's say some moms that had a baby, took three years off, and now is going back to work. But they don't have that two-year last two-year work history. You know, it can be an issue. So a lot of times they'll need to be back on the job for at least one year because they did have a, a, a history before. So again, there's just each circumstance can be its own unique circumstance, and a lot of times you just have to call a lender and say, "Well, this is what it is." You know, we'll, you know, give me a ruling. <laughs> a lot of times we're just the messenger up the line to the underwriter, and then they'll rule on it. So. Okay, so then uh, I ask usually about credit history. Like I say, most people will know. Uh, things that couldn't be an issue uh, will be like tax liens. Tax liens can take, you know, really wreak havoc in doing a mortgage transaction. So they got tax liens. Uh, they need to be pretty much resolved uh, before we close. Now, it can be also resolved by them working out a tax plan with the IRS. So there's a lot of things that way. Um, you know, with collections, uh, you might have heard, oh, I have some collections, do I need to pay them off? Not necessarily. In fact, there's a lot of times you won't even want to have, I recommended not, someone will say, oh, I can pay that collection off. Well, it's been there for two years, just leave it alone. Because I've heard, and you may say, well, why don't you know? But these, this credit score is always a big mystery to us lenders. We don't know the exact formula. Someone somewhere doesn't want us to know the exact formula which drives the score, but I've heard that any recent derogatory credit is just going to hurt your score. So even if you pay off a derogatory account, being that re reported recently could bring down the score. So that's why we usually don't recommend paying off a collection unless it's required that somehow in the transaction you prove that right here. Let me just introduce this is my assistant, Aaron. She's been processing Hi. for me uh, for the last couple of years. We were at a different company, went out of business, and then we landed here at Citywide. And we're back. So. Anyway, so, and then the next is uh, down payment. Of course, you can get by with zero down. Uh, number one, if they're a veteran, they have full VA eligibility. Uh, uh, you can get, you know, VA has zero down. They can, and you can do seller concessions. They can get it, get to the closing with zero money into this home. I mean, when I say zero, it's zero. You have the seller pay the closing costs, and uh, they have, all you have to do is pay some hookup fees for utilities and make your first mortgage payment. So, yeah, question. So I have a question about that with earnest money. When you're doing a VA loan or a zero down loan, how does the earnest money play out? Do they get a check back? Yeah, we, yeah, many times that'll be cut back. What about Utah, uh, Utah housing and all that? Still the same. Yeah, if it's a zero down, you can get the earnest money back. Interesting. Okay. Question? Okay. So remember, there's different programs over with down payment, but when I ask about down payment, sometimes you can say, oh, well, I have 20000 I mean, a good LO will go and say, okay, well, wait, wait, back up to that down payment. Where is that money? Oh, well, I'll be selling a motorhome. Oh, you're going to be selling a motorhome. Well, what's what's the book value? Well, it's worth about ten. Well, how much do you owe on it? Well, I owe eight. Well, you're only going to have about two thousand. I mean, you really need to ask about the down payment. Uh, I, no, as an LO, we have to ask. You guys don't really need to. I'm just kind of telling you what I ask for. So, down payment can be real tricky because, uh, you know, if you do need to go with a down payment, and it can be gifted. There's lots of documentation of how it gets gifted. There can be just major headaches with a relative that's giving some money to a, a grandson, let's say, but they don't want to let the lender show that they have, or, or 
they don't want to document their accounts that they have the money to give. Because with FHA, not only do you verify the transfer of the gift, you got to make sure that the donor had the money and just didn't go out and borrow it. That can be really complicated. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if you're going to get into this. I'm sure you are, um, but just in case not, uh, for a conventional loan, I've heard different answers. What's the percentage of a down payment usually on a conventional? It's usually the minimum is five percent on a conventional. Yeah, there are some. Uh, there is one program, I believe it's at three, but um, usually it's five percent. And also remember the, the biggie, which you've probably been told already, uh, if you have 20% or more down payment, you can avoid mortgage insurance. So that's always a big, a, a, you know, a, a real bogey that you want to try to reach as a lender. If someone has close to 20% down, uh, but maybe they have a 401k they can borrow and you say, if they can get that 20%, you really, the mortgage insurance, remember, I'll, I'll explain what mortgage insurance is. A borrower pays a company an insurance premium that in case their loan defaults, that the lender won't lose out a whole lot so they can have they can, uh, file a claim and get some of the money back. So it doesn't benefit you, it just benefits the lender. So if you can avoid it, by all means avoid it. Mortgage insurance is really getting to be uh, on conventional loans, it's credit score driven. So if you have a good credit score, the mortgage insurance can be a lot lower. Um, but if you don't have very good credit, that mortgage insurance can be pretty high. On FHA, uh, it's kind of a fixed amount. So again, uh, a good LO will work it out both ways and say, well, in your case, you probably want to go FHA. And, and, it, and it doesn't take us long to figure out both ways. And, and it's pretty clear cut. Most of the time, sometimes it's a toss up. But um, so, yeah. Um, Anything else for you know payment? Uh, remember, there are programs in Utah housing. If they're making under a certain amount, even if they're not a veteran, they might still be able to get in a home with zero down. Because that's probably, as you guys prospect, isn't that probably what most people say? Well, I don't have a down payment. I mean, so that and credit might be the biggest hurdles. And then the last thing I usually ask about: Okay, what's your monthly out outflow of debt? Uh, remember, as lenders, we only ask what the payment is. We really don't, you know, sometimes people get, well, I only owe, uh, you know, their balance. I, I don't really need to owe the balance. I know that sounds kind of silly, but we just look at cash flow to see if they can handle that payment. So they could owe, uh, for instance, student loans. You know, a lot of these medical guys, uh, they go through school, you know, they owe 200000 of uh, student loans, but their payments are only, let's say, 1700 a month, and they have a good income as a doctor. Uh, that sometimes it works even though they owe that much. Again, that just supports what we talked about earlier. It's that structured monthly outgo. If you've got X amount of dollars coming in and you're committed and, uh, uh, and obligated to make those monthly payments, the balances figure in, but not necessarily. It's, it's what your debt servicing is for the month. Yeah. And that's what's really, really critical in the qualification of the loan. And student loans are, as you guys probably know, a lot of times these student loan payments can be very minimal on a big balance. You know, 20000 you only owe only $60 a month. So, you know, that helps in the mortgage, uh, you know, get, get the mortgage. And so then I go over the debts. Um, yeah, and then car payments. Uh, usually if you're almost done with a uh, debt, we don't have to count it. So we do these ratios. So I, I pretty much, uh, all this together, usually in about a five-minute conversation with that borrower, we can tell uh, you know how things are going to look. So then the next thing I'll say, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to send you an email. Hopefully, uh, I usually CC you guys on, uh, you know, the realtor, but it's so it could be a slippery slope with a with the average buyer because they may not want to let you guys, as the realtor, know all their dirty laundry on credit. So they might, you know, I don't know. It, it's just kind of um, sometimes I, I I won't share everything with the realtor because the borrower may not want that. Uh, but they do need to know that we're in the loop, so I usually will CC you on that first initial email. But in details, uh, we usually aren't allowed unless unless the borrower doesn't mind us telling you. But um, usually we won't volunteer. So anyway, I send an email. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking my call today. Uh, this is what I'll need to get started. I usually always reiterate there is no there's no cost or obligation for me to have 
have me work on this for you. So, you know, they don't have to use me. There's no cost on the credit. We just hope that they'll send us the, the documentation that you need, which is usually a pay stub, W-2s, or tax returns if they were either commissioned or self-employed. Uh, usually the bank statements to document down payment. Um, usually those those things, pay stub, W-2s, and bank statements, uh, will pretty much, uh, if they can get that to us, then we can run that pre-qualification. So. Um, well, Aaron's here. Why don't, I, you, why don't you come up? We'll have what you're going to talk about, and then I'll kind of go back into. Um, well, <laughs> we're going to talk. Uh, let's, let's go over. Uh, well, when you were a, you were a buyer a couple of years ago, and so um, yeah. you can say okay. you are. And, and as as a buyer, what, what was important to you? When, when the realtor was involved and in, in, in that whole mortgage process? So for me, I, I because I'm in the mortgage industry, so it was probably a little different, but at, on the realtor part of it, I was, I wanted them to, it was important for them to know the property I was buying, kind of the condition of the property. You know, I was looking for an FHA loan, so I wanted them to make, you know, is it FHA approved? Do you know that you need FHA the, the addendum to the contract? They're a little different than conventional purchase contracts. Um, home inspections are involved with government like FHA loans. And so um, it was, I guess it wasn't as important, but it should be important, more important for someone that's not in the mortgage industry that my realtor was also a mortgage. You know, he, I want him to be an expert in knowing engaging the type of bar i was going to be um i knew what was going to be involved with all the documentation that they were going to ask for me to get i was getting the pre-approval i think that's huge just to make sure that you're you as a realtor you ask your did you tell them that? yeah yeah to get the pre-approval so before you guys start doing anything on the yeah. uh, go over property types um let's say that they get a seller um that has a rundown property. There's going to be different rules on on what maybe you could do uh, and what's required on on the FHA VA. She was also an underwriter at um, her old company, so mm -hmm. kind of knows a lot of the differences on on what's required in conventional versus FHA VA. Well, um, your government loans are going to be a little more nitpicky on the property, the condition of the property. There, there's different things that they require. All the outlets need to be covered. What else? I mean, uh, usually, bro uh, like cracked, cracked broken paint, legs, yeah. glass. On uh, government windows, loans, they right. want all that fixed. Conventional, so they're a little more lenient on it. So I think you should just be aware of the condition of the property that your client is looking at or you're showing them. And I don't know, they should probably know if they're doing conventional versus government. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I noticed with uh, government loans is if there are any safety issues, just because, you know, it's the government. So. So if there's more than three steps, there needs to be a railing, any kind of uh, deck out back with more than, is it what, about 18 inch drop off will need to have a railing, things like that, that you need to be aware that, oh, this could be an issue and it could cost our sellers some money to make it, you know, FHA. And that, that question you had earlier about the cash deal, I was kind of wondering, you know, if, if you see a listing that says cash only, that usually means there's some some issues uh, with the property, either zoning or whatever. I don't know if you meant for that when you said that cash only. Uh, because if you do see a listing, it says cash only, well, you want to know why. Uh, obviously, if you, it's probably a good reason why. Well, I see a lot of like conventional cash, it's just not FHA. So how often, how often do you get a, a house that's conventional or cash to get approved for an FHA, or is that uh, And that usually is, uh, there's usually something that, that uh, let's say a, a crawl space, if you have wood to ground contact with uh, FHA, and there's not, it's a three foot crawl space, mm -hmm. uh, and of course you don't get that lot here in Utah, because everybody has most of these kind of basement, but uh, that could be one thing right there, that well to dig out that whole area, it's a major cost, so really let's just say we can go conventional and FHA is not an option. So that's that's uh, some of the things that you'll see um, when you see a listing that might have uh, 
just conventional and cash. It's usually going to be a, if this is con conventional or cash, it's usually it's not a, a new property. <laughs> well, and sometimes with that too, it's with the flipping because the seller, you know, all these investors are now buying properties. And I say investors, someone who has an LLC. They're just buying these properties, redoing them, turning around, selling them. But with flipping, the flipping rule, you have, you know, they have to be vested on title for 90 plus days to go FHA, you know, to government. So a lot of them look, can only go conventional because of the new flip rule. So you have to be 90 days on title for some of the terms for the house? And you put it on FHA? The for on buyer? FHA. For on, yeah, if we have an FHA buyer. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. And I, we just, I've run into it several times since that rule came out where the seller's been on title 80, 40. And, you know, so you have to get a whole new contract. Is that the, at the time of closing they need to be on there for 90 days or is it the time of the loan origination? It's the time the of when the, the rep seat. Yeah, yeah, no. Oh, right. <laughs> and they'll go off of when the deed was recorded with the county as the start date. And to the time of the rep seat. To the time that the rep seat's executed. Date, so, so a lot of times they'll have to cancel the contract mm -hmm. and, and rewrite start all over again. Do you have to redo, so if something like that happened and you guys have done all of your underwriting and everything, is it restart the 30 to 45 yeah. day process all over again even though you've already done the underwriting and now we find out? Yeah, uh, it may I, not be quite that long, but you'll still have to get an appraisal. You don't want your appraisal done prior to the executed, yeah. per, you know, the rest of the yeah. date. So, yeah. And you have to order case numbers, you know, FHA requires a case number if you want that requested, you know, after the date yeah. of your... I so, ran into it, especially right when TRID came out last year, or was it last year? Is that what TRID was? Mm -hmm. I had a loan and I think on that one we were close to, you know, Sometimes they lose track of when the date is that they sign the deed and got put on title. So I think I was at 88 days or something. We had to, everything had to start all over. And with TRID, it took twice as long because I had to get the FHA number canceled and it was a nightmare. So just, that's just one thing to be aware of, especially when you, you know, if you're dealing with government loans and your seller, you know, the owner of record is Lemon Tree LLC. Well, hey, maybe you want to look as to when they purchased that property. Good point about TRID. Um, you guys may not know what TRID is. There was a new ruling with the government. It came out in, I think it's November, that all of us lenders had to do some major changes on how we disclose and how we close loans, and mostly just dissolve disclosures. And it did change the industry in fact, it kind of contributed to the company we were with. Uh, I think a lot of that had to do with the company we were with went under out of business, and Trid kind of was, uh, I think, a contributor. Anyway, that's one other thing. But what Trid is, in, in uh, summarize, up front, we have to send out a, a loan estimate, and that estimate has to pretty much conform to all these rules, and it's using about you know three or four pages to the borrower, and they have to acknowledge it. We either have to send it out snail mail, wait three days, or, and we can't even order an appraisal until they received it. So we have to, uh, usually what we do is we send an e-consent, uh, an email to the borrower saying, would you accept doing, seeing these disclosures via email as opposed to snail mail? So then that speeds everything up because they can just click on a few clicks and we get notification right away that yes, we can send out these disclosures. So we have to send, oh yeah, okay. On the rep C, it says that, on our rep C, about the electronic signatures, does that not apply to the loan? Is that gonna be two different things? Yes. Yeah, so we have to, con we send out our e-consent, they have to say yes, we all accept the disclosures, we even send the disclosures. They have to e-sign most of them, they have to wet sign some of them, and that can be quite a, an ordeal. I'm usually on the phone with probably half, half our borrowers would just think, <laughs> Getting those e signed and all the tech, you know, for tech savvy borrowers, it's usually not an issue. But for some, some of these other mm -hmm. folks, you know, we're all they're all confused on what they need to do anyway. It's uh, and just adds one more little kink to the lending business. Yeah. I think most are you guys. Most of them use Doc Blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which and so this different. is different than Doc Blue. So just be aware. <laughs> so 
we have our it seems system. to be a little more tech savvy. And then, and then also at TRID, uh, so that's on the front end, we have to disclose all this stuff, and they, they can't differ from the closing unless we have redisclosed for what we call change of circumstance, and we just go on and on and on. But then if, if, if the, uh, the term, as we're closing the transaction, three days prior to signing, you have to send out a, what we call CD, or closing disclosure. And this is a new rule, so this now has kind of delayed everything, that where before you you have your last condition signed off and you can close the next day, well, not necessarily now. We get our last little condition signed off and now we have to send out the CD. They have to accept it. And that's the other thing is they need to get on the computer, give it a mouse click to accept it. So then our three-day waiting period can start before the actual when it's signed at the title company. So that's what TRID's about. Do you ever heard TRID? So anything I missed? Um, no. that CD. Yeah. That, but they so all kind of guys come into play on the closing disclosure because we have to make sure all of our roles, like all of our realtor information is the license. Like license number, email addresses, you know, it's, it's completely so worthless. It's pretty much added about typically about in five days, uh, when you say rush, you probably heard from your lender saying, Hey, you know, don't don't do a you know, try to do maybe a 35-day uh, turnaround time from from Rep C signing or acceptance to closing. But you know, our average uh, our average processing is using just about 30, uh, 20, high 20s right now. But I I'd always recommend trying to do at least a 30 to 35-day closing because usually remember you're going to do your inspection. So before we even order the appraisal, you guys would want to get your inspection back. Remember, the inspection is not lender related at all. That's just between you guys and the buyer and seller to make sure that that home is in good shape. Because the appraiser, they don't crawl up in the attic or they don't check the sewer in there. So, anyway, um, yeah, the trick. In, uh, and so, those dates are important on, on your rep C dates. Uh, you want to talk to your lenders. You know, we're in a big hurry. What's the soonest we can get this one through? So, I know a lender. Like say you're getting an FHA loan, the lender's going to go and say, okay, we need to first make this house be inspected first. Um, do they also require an appraisal with the inspection? Yeah, the, the, the FHA all? appraisal is a totally separate deal from right. your property inspection. And, and uh, But is it required still? Like say someone's listing a house for you know 200000 and the buyer's wanting to do the deal, and he says, okay, well, the lender has to first do an inspection make sure it will approve for FHA, and then do they also require an appraisal? Yeah, okay. the appraisal slash inspection is the same thing in our case. It's the appraiser that goes out. Okay. Remember, we're talking different than the property inspection that you guys usually have a list of property inspectors that you'll call, you know, just to kind of do the due diligence for your buyers to make yeah, sure that's that's the that's totally, on your totally separate from our lending process. We don't even see those property inspections. Our appraiser doesn't, um, but when our when an FHA or VA appraiser goes out, they kind of do their own inspection. It's not as, thir as thorough as the property inspections, but yeah. they do. They do. will turn on the faucets. They check hot water heaters. Um, these are FHA appraisers I'm talking about, so they got to make sure they do. They have a list of things that they have to do um, as well. So they're like kind of the same person. But, you know, the property, is the one who's going to do your home inspection part of it, like the walkthrough kind of, they'll know, they're pretty, you, most of the people that I've dealt with know the difference if it's, they'll, mine asked if it was an FHA or conventional loan, so they could look for different things, knowing what could come up as an issue for me or for your, your client. And that's where they do, they can do that, the meth test, all that stuff. But, so those are good. Uh, those property inspections are good tools for your buyers. Mm -hmm. So when uh, when the inspection is being done, like that FHA loan, and there's how you said like you need a railing on a patio that's over 18 inches or like a socket or anything like that, um, can you just say like, oh yeah, we'll fix that when we get in, or is it like does it have to be fixed before? Or, no, we'll do the yeah, it has to be done prior to. And, uh, and then the appraiser has to go back out and verify it's done. So you got to repay the appraiser. Yeah, that's, uh, there's fees involved. It's uh, 
we just had that happen on paint on a garage where the appraiser go out they declined it because of the paint for that bitch so then they scraped it and painted it then we have to have the appraiser go back out and then you have to wait a couple days and then reissue cd so if the FHA appraisal doesn't go through the first time, it can push it back five to ten days. And then after they verify it and it doesn't go through or they don't include it, then you gotta pay them again. Yeah, you can't again oh, every time they go back out. Yeah, so it's 175 oh, 175. Ours was 175. We have to go back out and do the paint and check the water in your time. Yeah. Oh, there's been many times where you know they'll say that they'll give you the list of what is required, they being the appraiser, of what is is required. Sometimes it's not. Yes, it could be vague. Uh, you know, like what quality do I want to repaint, or you know, whatever. I mean, so then you go, well, this isn't good enough. I'm not going to pass it. You know, so then he's got to go back out. I mean, it's, it's kind of what you alluded to earlier. Does any transaction come? No. Oh, how you know, was <laughs> when you were asked, does that any transaction come about. through? Yeah. And and you know what? I mean, I talked to a lot of someone last night. Uh, an old buddy of mine. He goes, boy, does every any transaction not have a problem? I go, yeah. Every, Almost every one has some issue. Hopefully, it doesn't mean a delay, but it can mean a big hassle. They hardly ever go through nice and smooth. Maybe hopefully this cash transaction she's going to have will be nice. But I mean, there's just a hundred, hundreds of things. Yeah. What you expect a turnaround from the time that the appraiser actually shows up and does the appraisal inspection to actually to getting the appraisal. We had a, t a week from the time of the FHA appraiser went out until we actually received the documents. About five business days is, is about that what it is. Yeah, because they. So when do you, in your process of the lending, when do you order appraisal? That's one of the first. One of the first things, but I always ask the realtor, uh, okay, well, are you guys going to do a, a property inspection? Because this is the thing the buyer pays us for the appraisal. Yeah. Usually we get credit card information. We don't want to spend their money if there's a problem on the property inspection. Yeah. So most of the time, and that's why you really want to make sure you're good on those rep seat days. That if you, you know, if you're going to take a week to do an inspection, sometimes even ten days for you get an inspector out. Remember, this is your property inspector, not our appraisal. Before we order the appraisal, I mean, we're already sometimes two weeks before we even order the appraisal. And you have to be aware too of the property location. Because sometimes it takes a while to get an appraiser assigned, you know, to the order that we're requesting. So if you're in a really, if the property's in a really rural area, sometimes those appraisals take longer to yeah. come back. So, and I know most, almost every rep seat has an appraisal deadline date. So just kind of be aware of that to give yourself, you know, when you put that date in there. Just know, gauge the area of where that property is located. And you can re contact your lender yeah. and see if they most of us will know the turnaround times on getting an appraisal back okay right, right now i think typically the typical for us all i hear is about like five say to about seven, five to seven yeah. business days from when we order it but then they usually take a day or two before they get out there so it's usually about a week after they're, they've inspected on five, four to five and the, yeah and not to interrupt you but the big thing too sometimes we run into where the appraiser can't get in contact with the person to get into the property so you know it's good to stay in contact with your lender and they can say hey we ordered this just let the realtor know you know that someone will be reaching out to them because most of the time we put in a realtor's name and phone yeah, number using the me. listing agent's uh, info so if they're out of town yeah because that, be yeah, that kind of holds up yeah sometimes if, you know if they get the property scheduled then the turnaround time happens a lot faster than if they're calling and calling and they can't get a hold of someone else. Do they have access to the lockbox? I was going to ask the appraiser. Yeah, yes. usually. Oh, that's all right. So they can say lock, yeah. But a lot of times they'll need to know if it is. So it's still talking to that agent if it is lock box. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about when the appraisals come back. Well, well let's go, um, let's talk about the because I got to the pre-approval process, so I've been on the phone with the borrower, I'm going to send an email to them. Hopefully they'll send me back the documentation that we need to get them pre-approved. And then, uh, let's say it all comes back, we run it through the system, things look pretty good. And then we can uh, say, yeah, go out and start looking up to X amount of dollars. Or you'll uh, issue them a pre-approval letter. Yeah, usually though, I, I, a lot of times the, the borrowers don't necessarily need it. You guys will need it as agents when we go to present the offer, and a lot of times you'll want it. Kind of customized on 
know, do you want a price in there, or just up to you know different things, or give or an address on the letter. So sometimes those pre-approval letters uh, can be, you know, you might want to customize a little bit with your letter. Um, so then uh, let's talk about those pre-approval letters because they can be very, very flimsy. Uh, let's say you're a, a listing agent and you have a buyer, a couple of offers, and now you want to make sure, and let's also say that you just had a, a buyer that fell through, and so now you'd already spend 25 days on one potential buyer. That one fell through. You had to relist. You got now two or three more buyers. Boy, you want to make sure that this one is not going to fall through, and you get this pre-approval letter from you know, ABC lending. Well, who's he? You just need to be aware of these these pre-approval letters are only as good as the, the lender giving it to you. <laughs> but what do you do as a as a listing agent? You know, maybe let's advise you on that. Well, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, you can try to call that lender and say, "Well, tell me about that. And how, how solid do you think it looks?" And hopefully, they're up front with you and say, "Well, you know, especially if they say something." Well, he has a you know, I, I saw that the bank account has 100000 so that the down payment looks pretty solid. I mean, things like that, you can maybe get those warm and fuzzies that you're looking for. But it can be challenging for you guys as, as representing your seller to know if you really have a qualified buyer. They're going to drag you along for up to that financing deadline date and say, well, sorry, we don't qualify. That's a challenge. I'm, that's why I'm glad I'm not a realtor in most cases. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure you've had quite a few over the years. Right? Yeah. Um, so that pre-approval letter, yeah, that could be important. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, anything else, Aaron? Let me make my list here as we go along first. Um, okay, let's talk about seller concession. So a lot of times you're writing an offer, you don't really want to check with your lender on uh, you know, what's their down payment situation or their money situation. Do I need to make sure that my that we're going to make this offer and cover the closing costs? Because let's say someone only has, um, you know, let's say you're looking at a two hundred thousand dollar home with your FHA minimum down buyer. He only has seven thousand dollars to work with. Well, that's barely enough to meet that three and a half percent FHA minimum. So you're going to definitely need to have your seller, uh, have the seller pay the closing costs. So that's very important because there's a lot of times a rep sees done and then I hear from the realtor and go did you put in the closing costs oh no I forgot to and you gotta go back and it doesn't look good to a lender when you have a price at 200 with no seller concessions and then suddenly there's an addendum oh it's a 205 with 5,000 concessions in fact I, years ago I had a problem with that the underwriter says well we don't want to see that it was just raised to cover the selling the closing costs well that is the reality of it but if you do it from the get-go it can at least make it a lot easier. Any comments on that? Have you had that come up? Or you've raised the price just to cover the closing costs. It can be an issue. So you want to just make sure you know. Okay. I've heard a lot of people talk about bumping the rate in order to cover closing costs. What are you doing that? Yeah, that's also a good option. So uh, let's say that the seller really won't budge. Um, or you have a valuation problem where you just don't want to keep bumping the sales price to cover that. And yeah, a lender can bump the rate an eighth or a quarter or three eighths, and sometimes, usually for every eight increase in rates, let's say you go from three and a half or three and five eighths on the rate, you can usually get about a half a percent off of the rate, say a percent. So about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars, let's say on a two hundred thousand dollar price, off those closing costs. So if they raise it up a quarter, maybe that might help you about twenty five hundred dollars for closing costs. So that's always a good option. And a good lender will usually kind of think, oh, well, if you're tight on money, we can build this option to it. So that's a good, that's a good point. So seller concession, yeah, that can also be uh, very important. Also, you know, I've heard someone say, oh, well, the seller won't budge. On the, you know, they're not going to pay any closing costs. Well, as we all know, $200,000 price with no seller concessions and two hundred five with 5000 and it's the same for the seller. So usually... A seller, if you present it that way, is, uh, you know, will accommodate. And then that just is a way that the buyer doesn't have to come up with as much down payments. What about on if, if they run into a situation like that where you just the seller just won't do it for whatever reason? 
what about bumping the rate and having those things? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, and then that's always that other option is that bumping the rate. Um, and how much would you And that's usually up to about, and usually when, if you can't bump it too much to get big, you get a good bank if you're bumping maybe in that first quarter. If you keep going too high, then they end up paying a higher rate and not get yeah. your bank to bump. So you're only talking maybe uh, one to one and a half percent of the closing costs would be way in that kind of case. But, so maybe, you know, three four thousand at an average price in the low 200 around here. So. Sorry, my bad. We already talked about that. Oh, that's okay. I heard it's that my seller wasn't Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the seller, even even if you say, well, why don't we just bump the price to cover those seller concessions? Nope, won't do it. Yeah, I had no joke. Yeah. So I had I had a big dry hunt in this morning. So then another thing as an agent, you guys may get uh, feedback from your borrower saying, gosh, they want this, they want that, why they want this. I mean, we have to validate so many things, and there's cross checks, and it just causes documentation issues. So then you get, um, you know, you get those situations where they keep, you know, the lender keeps coming back. Well, we don't know a lot of times what to ask for until we start getting into these and doing all these cross checks. Like one of the, some of the things that Aaron has to do is to uh, check some of these lists. They check. Uh, Social Security, we have uh, Social Security numbers against any properties that have been owned under that Social Security number. So like for instance, you're, you know, you get, you're getting down into the process maybe two weeks in and you see that this borrower has a property in Florida that's, that's showing up on their, what do we call that, the property and I don't know what the list is called anyway, <laughs> this cross check. Well, we run a fraud guard. Oh, yeah, fraud guard. You guys don't need to know. But anyway, what I'm saying is, but one of these things that can come up, that now they have to prove that this Florida property doesn't have a loan on it, sometimes that can be challenging. I and mean, just getting the documentation that we need is always a challenge. And hopefully the best lender is the one that can get that and ask for it early. But early is sometimes all out. Sometimes it doesn't come up until the end. But a good lender hopefully will know it. Um, you know, within a week or so of the process. Um, yeah, and then we also have to validate tax returns. Oh, that's been an issue. The last few years, since the mortgage meltdown there in 07 or 08, now we have to validate all income. Because a lot of times you have a self-employed borrower that can give the IRS one set of tax returns, but then they come to the lender and, oh, and now it's so they show that they make a lot more money. Well, we have to send in a form that they release, the, the borrower signs, called 4506T. We send it off to the IRS. They then say, yeah, that wasn't or They send us the transcripts and we match up the numbers. So, yeah, that was what was that we're accounting for. That can also raise a lot of red flags because if they've written off things that we didn't know about, it can be an issue. So, again, these validations can be a big problem. Also, when you're dealing with a self employed borrower that just filed a return, but we need to count that year. Sometimes it can delay the closing. For instance, uh, someone that needed the 2015 self-employed income return to show that year, but they just filed the returns two weeks ago. We have to wait till the IRS can validate it, which sometimes delays the closing, and that's been an issue for that. Or remember, in one case, we had a guy that. Uh, we were waiting on the tax validations, and we were only a week or so out from closing. And the IRS kept saying, well, we, we're not getting that this, something's wrong with the record. And so we changed his name because he had different names. And um, it turns out he had filed his tax returns in three years. What delayed the closing? The realtor was all upset at us. I said, well, what do we do? I mean, he didn't file his tax returns, so we can't validate the We finally got it resolved, but I mean, it was a big delay. Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing is, is if you're with your clients and just trying to help them understand, we're trying to help them. And we have to do it within the guidelines that are out there, the lending guidelines. I, we had an individual, hey, I made, he made a lot of money. I mean, he made, you know, $200,000 plus a year. And, you know, he was pretty arrogant about it. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's that's great to make that kind of money. And, but he had uh, some overdrafts on his checking account. 
And uh, the question came up, well, why do you have these overdrafts in chicken? Well, I don't manage the money very well. I mean, that's just not the thing you just say to your lender. <laughs> you make a lot of money, but you let your finances go sideways. You just don't, you know, we're just trying to help them. And uh, sometimes <laughs> it's a little tense, but uh, we're just trying to help them. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, as an agent on, on both sides that appraisal coming back because that's always a big key, right? When you're representing your seller, the appraisal coming back at value, know if you priced it about right. Also, could be an embarrassing moment if it comes out the, uh, you know, the appraisal comes in at two fifty and you got it under contract at two ten. Hopefully, your seller who may not even know what the appraisal came in at, but boy, you know, that could, could cause issues. Uh, and you want everybody to be happy, obviously. So, uh, when the appraisal comes in, let's say it comes in low, as a listing agent, to advise your seller what to do, a lot of it's going to depend on, well, do we have backup offers? Do we want to lower their price? How, you know, as a listing agent, I'd say, well, call that lender and say, well, what, what will the buyer do, or what could they do if we only come down? Let's say, uh, let's use Prince. Let's say that the home's under contract for 220, the appraisal only comes in at 200. Maybe your seller will go to 210, but can the buyer come up with that extra 10? Because we're going to base our loan off 200. Because remember, the loan is always going to be based off the lower of the appraisal or the sales price. So, again, those are things as listing agents advising your seller with a low appraisal. You know, a lot of times you want to go to uh, the managers here and kind of advise you a little bit on that. So, uh, I try to talk to the lender and see, uh, you know, what what the buyer situation is, um, if you can. How frequent does that happen in practice? When well, late, lately it's been a little more often because our market has been climbing so fast that those uh, appraisers can't use the closed comparables, and you have multiple offers, and the, the multiple offers. You know they're coming in above the list. Yep. Well, and the appraiser can't uh, validate, let's say, their their argument that it's worth so much when they have to use. You know they have their rules with their um, it's called the use, the use path or something. They have their uh, appraisal rules nationwide that they have to follow. It can only be within certain uh, percentages of closed comparable sales. Well, the other thing that of course, as a, uh, as a listing agent with a little appraisal, probably your first thing is say, well, can you send me that appraisal so I can look and see what comps they use? Because maybe when you priced it, there was a pretty good comparable sale that the appraiser just totally missed, or maybe two. Usually, they're, you know, that's their job, and they usually will try to find, they try to accommodate most of the time, I find. But they just don't want to, you know, if they could, if they could, Justify that value that it's under contract. So remember, they know they have a copy of their rep seat as they go out to the home. So they already know kind of what they're aiming for. And if they can accommodate and justify it and not, not have a lot of red flags on their report, then they usually will try to do that. But, um, you know, sometimes in these fast moving markets, that can be a challenge. So any other things on appraisals? Of course, appraisals coming back is when you're on the buyer side. Uh, sometimes a, a low appraisal can mean saving your buyer some money. We had one just the other day. Had to go down about ten thousand. Just and again, the, the value was probably really there. They had like ten offers on this property. They had to go above list price to get the offer, and here they got the offer. Came to us, and the appraiser says, "Sorry, it's not worth." In that case, we actually went from FHA to conventional, ordered another appraisal. That appraiser came in low, not as low as the first one. And the buyer, I mean, the seller just said, well, obviously, we're going to have the same problem who we might have to sell it to. Let's just lower the price. So, uh, but in, in a low appraisal situation, save the buyer some money. So the buyer's agent went to the seller's agent and said, hey, you can't sell anywhere else. You might as well. That happens, and then the deal falls apart. Who buys those appraisals? Oh, good question. Yeah. Usually, the most lenders will collect credit card information up front from the buyer, 
Now, in that case, though, the buyer's agent um, was aware enough to say, hey, if you want a second appraisal, like you guys pay for it, and they put it in the agenda. So, yeah, you can negotiate that. I mean, if the seller really wants a second appraisal, they can pay for it because appraisal fees can add up. I mean, for 75, 450 ish on most appraisals. So, when you do an appraisal like that, you say you collect credit card information, are you collecting? Are you billing their credit card up front, or does that come out at closing? Good question. Most lenders, when we were before, we bill credit card. Uh, it's citywide. If we're dealing with an agent, it usually was the Century 20 and Everest, and I can tell you most of the time, the credit card is not billed, and we just sell it up at, at closing. But it all is going to be dependent on you know, how often that happens and how often it gets abused, because you know, citywide it has to pay the appraiser, and the bills come. Yeah, it's just, you know, are we getting enough business from Century 21 Everest that we going to raise a fuss over one appraisal or two? Well, probably not, but, you know, that's one good thing about you guys using, using us over here is we won't, and I got to be careful with that. I'm sure Ben would probably not be anything, but normally we don't collect that credit card information up front unless, unless it looks squirrely. You know, I've, I've kind of got some feeling like, oh, this really didn't seem like a, Solid deal, or that the likely it'll close. Because if it's likely to close, we'll get it to close. Yeah. So that's how you know if it's likely to close. Did he ask for your credit? Card? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, a lot of times I'll do this. A lot of times I'll I'll ask for the credit card information, get it, but not bill it. And so then the buyers are thinking, oh, I'm on the hook for the appraisal. And I tell you what, that really does have an incentive. I mean, you only want to deal with people that are serious. We only want to, and you only want to, because once they're into it, you know, have some skin in the game, you know, things can change a little bit on their motivation. If a seller has done an appraisal themselves as part of the listing process, is there any weight given to that? Does it not It has to be an appraisal or by us. But a lot of times we can go back to that same appraiser, have them uh, basically reinspect, and then maybe are at a reduced rate to the buyer. Uh, and, and since that appraiser is already, already familiar with that property uh, and, and, and the value satisfactory to everybody, then yeah, a lot of times we can use that. I wouldn't say it's, um, how often do you see that happen? I mean, it does happen occasionally. Because remember, those appraisals, there was a new rule that came out a couple of years ago. The lenders just can't use their favorite appraiser because they're afraid we're going to have to have the mortgage meltdown. That lenders and appraisers were in cahoots, falsifying and inflating appraisals, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. So there was new rules came out that lenders just can't use their favorite appraisers when they want. So now there's kind of a, uh, it's supposed to be a random selection process through an appraisal management company. And you might have heard the initials AMC. So AMC, if you ever do a lot of appraisals, uh, the AMC is who has to order it. They assign an appraiser, but sometimes you can um, have the AMC reach out to that appraisal that was done beforehand, or the appraiser, and they might be able to. I think in those cases, they have to show that it originally was ordered through the right methods of payment. We don't know if you, mm -hmm. There's Probably some rules on that, but you know, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt to, to ask, because we've had it, I've had it done the last year or two, where we used an existing we didn't use that existing appraisal. He has to go back out after our rep seat day and show that it was our appraisal, but you know, he's from the appraisal. All right. Um, you know, I've kind of been on this first hour kind of more in the mortgages, but I kind of want to know maybe from you guys' point what questions uh, you might have to help you because you know, I'm only a mortgage guy and I kind of don't know from a realtor standpoint what questions you would have. I try to foresee what most of them are. Uh, re regarding um, mortgage insurance, so with FHA now, with the, the rules change that you can no longer get rid of mortgage insurance in an FHA loan. It used to be like you paid up to 10 or 11 years. Is that yeah, right? Go ahead on that. I, I don't know. I, I know that you can't ever just get rid of it yeah. showing you have that 20% equity. Let's go over mortgage insurance. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I know. 
But on, on FHA, yeah. it's going to stay on the length of the loan, or will it drop off? At, no, uh, it doesn't. Yeah, I don't think it doesn't drop off anymore. But that's what I, if you're explaining this in part of the loan process to a buyer to explain advantage disadvantage. I know you've got to put more down with the conventional, but you can still get an appraisal for it, once your loan to value gets at whatever 78% or whatever yeah, right 80%. It's really 80%. That's well, when the old FHA seven. would drop off, it would be 78% of the, not at any current value, it's just what the original loan amortized down with the Yeah, the mortgage insurance. Uh, like I say, your lender will want to work it out both ways. Because let's say you have a 685 credit score and they only have 5% uh, down. So they could go conventional or FHA. But in that kind of a case, they might just want to go FHA and just have your lender working out both ways. Because there are going to be pros and cons. And then mortgage insurance on conventional can be structured now where you build it in for the rate. You can build it in that it's paid at with a, seller, a large seller concession at closing up front. Uh, there's lots of ways to do this mortgage insurance now on conventional. But remember, it's credit score driven. And 760 and higher is the highest category for mortgage insurance borrowers. And 740, 760, 720, 740 to 759, 720 to 739, you know, every 20 points makes a big difference. Once you both go below 700, with conventional mortgage insurance, those premiums can get pretty hefty, and that's why usually at that point below 700, it's kind of like, hey, well, let's look at FHA because FHAs are pretty much going to be the same. Also, FHA is usually better for marginal borrowers on debt to income ratios, um, lower credit, just getting it through. Usually, those are going to be your FHA type of borrowers. Also, remember there's an FHA maximum limit. Here in the Salt Lake area, it's, um, it's a three, 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 twelve, eight. three twelve eight. So each county has its own limit. Davis County, and geez, I used to know that. They change, they change every year, so it's, it's usually updated. I think in Davis County, it's actually more. Yeah, it is. It's yeah, yeah. 320 or yeah, something. Yeah, it's not 320. Something in the Park City area, it's six. Yeah, and then the rural areas are usually going to be less. Um, usually, they're more like. But so, so that's something you always want to check on. Well, you won't need to necessarily check on it, but you may want to as a, as a listing agent, because obviously if you're listing a home in uh, 12 County, well, maybe not 12 County, let's say you want to Cooper County, you don't want to have FHA as an option. That's well over the FHA county. So you're saying say your credit score is, you know, 750 high? Um, and you can't come up with the five percent. Would you rather do a conventional loan than an FHA, or still you want to do an FHA? Uh, if you just have minimum down, if you're uh, buying, yeah. If, if you have minimum down, a lot of times just the down payment. They only have like just the very three and a half percent. Then pretty much just FHA. Well, there's other factors too, though. Do they have a lot of debt? What's their income? I mean. That's going to yeah. that's gonna factor into whether they're going to go conventional versus FHA or VA or USDA. You, and, you know, you talk housing. And you guys, as, as realtors, won't really, I mean, just hand them off to the lender and have them figure that out. So you won't really need to get involved. But you want to definitely have that lender work it out both ways and see if both are an option. I just have a logistics question. So, like, you have a, a client and they're pre approved, and then they find a house and you get the offer accepted. So, like, what I've kind of been doing is just like emailing the rep C to the loan officer I'm using, and then they usually write back, like, okay, got it. And then, do they just start doing everything, like ordering the appraisal? And you don't have to tell them, like, are you ordering the appraisal? I mean, like, how involved are you in, like, should we be in that? Oh, yeah, yeah question there because you know the loan officer usually will ask you about the appraisal and when you they can order it. I always do and say well, what's the deal with the property inspection? Is there going to be when is that going to be done so we can order the appraisal? Because remember you don't want to spend spend the, the, your buyer's money on an appraisal on, on a property that may fall through due to the inspection. So usually usually right away they'll ask that but if they don't you kind of are assuming that yes they're 
proceeding with everything. Right, that's just kind of but, <laughs> but you know, that again, dealing with a lender, especially if you're you're representing a buyer, but the buyer says, oh, I want to use my, my brother-in-law. Boy, that's really when you, as a, as a realtor, want to be in touch with them. Don't just trust the brother-in-law that he's a good mortgage guy. Try to do as much homework as you can, bugging them, saying, okay, if you got the appraisal, we're going to keep me in the loop if you don't mind, or whatever. But I would, at least I would, is that as a realtor. Well, I think they need to stay in the loop, because you guys need to make sure all those the settlement that you know all your deadlines that are listed on there are met and if you need to get addendums to extend the settlement date or right. something comes up with the appraisal and you're going to have to change it paper, you know because all that's going to require a new piece of paper to be typed up and initial signed by everybody okay, that's I why like finding a good lender is so true that it's way cool where you after a while you just pass it off you know you're in good hands right but but, but when there are when those buyers come and say I'm working with you know a guy in my neighborhood who's a mortgage guy and, and you guys are just kind of hoping he knows what he's doing or she or whatever uh, you know try to try to make that extra call uh, reach out to those lenders and say hey, tell me about you know have you ordered the appraisal uh, what's the status can you do it? I was just gonna say for us the, the trigger is really the rep seat we get the rep seat immediately we're looking at the we're looking at the dates. Yeah, that's okay, that's the first thing. And then we go to work on trying to make sure, again, that inspection is critical to the appraisal. So we should put our, like, so when I send my email, it says rep seat, say it was accepted, and then say we scheduled our inspection for this. Yep, and yeah, then and then all of a sudden it starts flowing. It's it's sequential, and, you know, you try to get out, you got all these things floating out here, and as a loan officer, we try to get them, we try to get them in sync, so, uh, there's minimal lost time, money, frustration. It's all sequential. And uh, but the first thing for us is that repsy, and that's the trigger for us to time to move forward because we have hard dates of disclosure and all kinds of things that take place, and we got to make sure that those dates are achievable. Um, and uh, because we, you know, we we got to meet those dates. Yeah, and probably that, you know, that email you're talking about is very important to us lenders. So to say, okay, here's the rep, so you all sign, kind of give us, okay, which title, because otherwise it's just safe as a phone call saying, hey, who are we using for title? Usually just sometimes there's an accompanying uh, sheet that you guys hold on, I'm pretty sure you have here, of all the parties involved uh, in the transaction. So it's very important to us who we're using. Um, they put those dates on the property inspection, that means that just kind of say up front, the inspection is supposed to be on this such a date. I should know. You know, if there's problems, I'll let you know. So don't order the appraisal until after this date. A good thing to do in an email uh, from that very gate to help your number. And if it's like a brand new house, and you know, they're just kind of getting the inspection just to know, would you order the financing appraisal like any sooner? Because uh, yeah. you really don't expect anything. Right, right. No? You know, on a, on a newer home or a very, you'll know, uh, obviously, so you guys go through a lot of properties. Boy, what is the most likely the odds of having any issues with inspection? I'm using a newer home, in good shape. You can probably get going on the appraisal, but again, it's going to be on what the deadlines. But if you are in a very big hurry, yeah, you can get going right away on that appraisal, uh, so you can be ahead of the game. I mean, a lot of times now you'll get a vacant house, and it'll say closing on or before, and everybody's in a, would like to close before. There's nothing wrong with ordering that appraisal ahead of time. It's just really the risk of, gosh, would that appraisal money be out if there's a problem on the inspection? But um, that's very rare, actually, to kind of have a, a deal killer on the inspection. A lot of times you have issues, but most of the time you guys have worked it out. Right. As you're going to say, you know, with Citywide, the good news is one of the benefits dealing with Citywide is that we're a correspondent mortgage banker meaning we control the process. Mm -hmm. We have our own underwriters, it's all here, it flow the information flows back and forth. And you know, Aaron is extraordinarily competent. I mean, uh, we had uh, it's not uncommon for us to close a loan within twenty one days. I mean that's unheard of in the industry. But you know, that's assuming everybody's cooperating. And those are rare there's, don't there's want to do twenty one days as a normal course of action. But in those kind of cases when you're dealing with a lender you know 
we can get it through and we say, you know, in this case, let's let's do it. I think that uh, in, we can maybe in that particular case we had we had we were controlling the process, but we had cooperation from the, uh, the, the buyer to get us the information we needed. We had a cooperation from the seller to get the information we needed because as long as everybody cooperates, man, we can fly with these things. And the realtor, because like I don't talk to the realtor very much in my position, but we are always requesting things from the realtor, such as an updated addendum, you know, getting, and it could be for getting the name, adding a middle initial to the buyer's name, or uh, I think the other thing I see a lot is just be aware of what's going in your purchase contract because a lot of times they'll list personal property, you know, items that, and if you have questions about any weird things that come up, I'd say, you know, go to your lender and kind of reach out to your, your loan officer and say, hey, is this going to fly? Do we need to have the verbiage different on here? And because sometimes you run into where the underwriter is like, I don't like this. And I just, I have one loan that's in closing. We're now on addendum six, you know, because things keep changing, such as if your seller concessions change, if your earnest money changes, let your loan officer know because all of that affects anything in that purchase contract because that's... Yeah, a lot of times we'll get addendum four and we haven't seen... One, two, one, two or three. three. <laughs> well, I guess my question was made more for Russ. How's the transaction coordinators play in with this whole conversation you're talking about? Um, they're not really going to, um, I guess. I mean, the transaction coordinator would only, if you called and said, hey, will you call the lender and see what's going on with the whole blah, blah, whatever. But I'll send that to when they're requesting things. So they request, like, if you need an addendum. Or they we usually go right they're to the come to you and come right yeah. to the mm -hmm. But, you know, like with the John Leslie's team, they have a kind of their own little coordinator person. So I'd always go to them. But that's, that's like a team situation. Um, they're going to come to you because ultimately, at the end of the day, you're, it's your transaction, really, even though you've got their... Now, once they've come to you, I mean, if you need it, you could call them the transaction coordinator and say, hey, we put together a that says that da, 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 and send it out, and they'll do that. Is there anything that you guys, on, on the top of your head, that you want us to... Do you have any questions in the mortgage process? If you're a uh, listing agent and you're evaluating offers or any multiple offer situation, obviously a cash buyer is going to be the, the most ideal situation. If you were to take it down from there and evaluate each of the loan types, how would you stack those up? If everything else is equal and just you're yeah. looking, they have an FHA, they have a conventional FHA. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I know if I was let's say, selling my home and I saw that, I would, I know, like you say, cash would be the first first one you want to take to see what is the value, but second would be, you know, a conventional with 20% down. It usually is going to tell you that the buyer's probably pretty solid. If you can really try to iron out what their down payment is, most of the time, a larger down, I guess it's discriminatory, but larger down usually means they're a little more financially stronger, all the way from, you know, across the whole gamut, not just, just down. But, Sometimes you can still get a marginal credit person and maybe just inherit a hundred grand. Uh, you know, I mean, but those are usually the larger down will be the one that, that I would, at least as a being in the mortgage business, would probably pay uh, you know, a conventional larger down loan as opposed to a deductible. Or a pre qualification level. Yeah, pre I got a letter. Yeah. My letter. Yeah. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Let's do the deal. Well, and then again, like we talked about on these letters, just you know, they're, they're loose. They can be uh, very flimsy. So don't put a lot of bearing in those letters, but if maybe with a further phone call. Uh, and Or ask around the office. Hey, have you ever dealt with this, uh, this damn money over such? The hiring's kind of flaky. Oh, no, I've got what he knows what he's doing. So if you got a letter from, you know, someone that, uh, that somebody's dealt with, hey, you know, that really is. I mean, like I say, loan officer is 80 to 90 percent of what how all starts right from the get go. They're pretty good and they know what they're doing. Most of the time they can sniff out if the deal won't work early on. Anything else? What's our time? A little, a little ways? 
whatever you want to see. <laughs> Up to 20 minutes. Just, uh, let's talk about all people. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say as realtors, I just think it's important for you guys to have a really good relationship with a lender, a mortgage specialist, you know, to be, so you can gauge your client, know what's available out there, the differences between the FHA, the VA, USD, all the options, you know, Utah Housing, Citywide does tons of Utah Housing ones. And know that those, I don't think you touched on that, but a lot of these, some of these programs come with income limitations, yeah. you know, not just property location, but, you know, they're qualified off the amount of annual income that comes into the house. and. Yeah, usually, uh, some Utah housing, a household of three in the Salt Lake area, was it 82? Is that? Well, they just revised yeah, they just it. Changed it's it all. Okay. It's it's down at 865. So, depending on. Change. It used to be 70. Yeah. So, yeah. They change, you know, things change all the time. So. But I think it's just important for you guys to be aware of that, just because then you can, you know, there's different. Yeah, but, but, at the yeah if you find someone who's. Who seems to have a good job? They say they have good credit. But, oh, sorry, I just don't have a down payment, uh, so I'm not ready to. All right, I can't buy. Oh well, no, you still might be able to. Let me have you uh, contact. You know, my friend, let my lender call you and just ask you questions. That's usually the thing that, like I say, with Leslie, it's uh, her. Her deal is she finds a motivated buyer, and it might just be from her prospecting. So it's nobody she knows at all. Her first thing is. Hey, do you mind if I have Dale call you? Oh, yeah, no, no problem. You know, you'll ask us a couple questions, just go the phone. We kind of get a good gauge of uh, what's going on. So, I mean, that's, that's very important. I was going to go over a little bit about the funding. Now, remember, you, you, let's say you've gone through the whole process, things are good, the CD's been sent out. Again, that's the, the tread rule, the closing disclosure. The three days have been waited. Now you go to the title company, you sign the docs, the closing has been done. The transaction's not all the way done. Remember, there's that funding, the recording, the whole bit. And I can tell you, where we used to work before, it was not an easy process. You get to the closing, things look fine. The package would then go from the title company back to the lender, because we have to review that everybody signed where they're supposed to. Oh, where we were before, there was always some issue with, oh, well, they didn't dot this I. They didn't miss this document, uh, whatever. At least citywide so far, that's been a huge change for me anyway. And I'm, I love it, obviously. Uh, but kind of be aware. And I always, when I go to the closings, I usually say, are you guys going to be around tomorrow? Because about one out of six or seven times, there's something missed. And I got to call you and email you over something you sign real quick to get back to us. Yeah, well, we won't delay it long. But boy, if I can't reach you, it could delay it more. Because remember that funding, uh, and as a as a, if you're the list on the listing side, you usually don't want to have. I'm sure that uh, your management will agree. You don't want to let your buyers, uh, these potential buyers, move in or give them the keys till that money is in your seller's account. At the title company, the title company says, yeah, we got it. It's your money now. But at least I know if I was selling the property, nobody's moving in until I got my money. And most, and I think that's what you're looking on the buys. Now, sometimes there's extenuating circumstances. Uh, and maybe, you know, what's very common is, oh, we'll let you move your stuff into the garage because there was a the bank wire from the title company to the lender. Put in a wrong number, it got delayed, so I had to go over the next day, but they had the movers today. Oh, I'm sure Russ has had that come up many times where you have people in a moving van. Geez, I just need somewhere to put it. Okay, you can put it in the garage. Uh, you know, that's really up to you want to talk to um, a lot of the seasoned realtors and what they've done in those kind of situations. These situations are going to be different. How do the wire transfers work with that? So I know if you have cash buyers, you use the the seller's title company, right? And then, so do I just tell the seller's title company the bank that my people are using, or do you mind like who? Uh, you, set usually, that up? they'll get the. Uh, usually, you want to have the title company send wiring instructions to that cash buyer so they can wire okay. the money to them. Okay, That's so I just talk to the title company about that. Yeah. And the title them. company will all have their own wiring instructions. Uh, they have. Anybody that works there knows, oh, I'll get it to you, and they got it all, all done using few mouse clicks to you right away. 
uh, because yeah, that's what happens again on these wires. Again, uh, that's on that funding process. So you sign the paperwork. Now, now about three or four wires a lot of times have to happen, and they all, all have to be coordinated. Especially when you have that domino effect. You know, somebody's selling, but they're using that proceeds to, to close on another home, on, on another transaction. They all do it the same day, or or it's lined it up. They kind of happen all the same day. It can be a lot of juggling. Your title company can be uh, again having a good title person can be a big asset in those kind of situations. But then you're dealing with the other side of the transactions title company, and maybe they aren't as responsive, and they're at lunch when you're trying to get an answer. So every, a lot of times that funding process can really roll to the next day. I would always, as agents, I would always try to be prepared that if somebody really needs their money, your seller, by a certain day, try to close or, or have it, try to give you a day or two leeway. Because I'm, I would tell you how many times things have delayed an extra day when we really could have signed a day or two before. But we just didn't because, oh, the closing date was on the 25th, so we waited till the 25th. No, the 26th was supposed to be the funding date, but there was a mix-up that somewhere. Because there's hundreds of things that can go wrong with that funding. Well, I'm not to interrupt you, I apologize. But the, I will say, the good thing about TRID is with this closing disclosure that goes out, you know, before I request mine, I verify when we're closing, when they expect the funding date. So that this closing disclosure goes out, most of the time the bottom line is very accurate as to who, the amount of money that needs to be brought in by the buyer. And, and so you have, then you have the three days to get, they can wire their money over so that there's ample amount of time to get the funds into escrow or title. Also so that rule, funding does happen. A new rule a couple years ago was, uh, any amounts over 10000 has to be a wire, not a cashier's check anymore. So uh, pretty much we just tell everybody, plan on bank wires. That's kind of what we do now. The CD ever gets sent out, does it have to be three days? So if it goes into a fourth day, does it cause an issue? No, no, no. The minimum of three days, not yeah, the minimum. The mi yeah, you just, it's, when they acknowledge they receive that closing disclosure, you, the earliest signing date is three days from that date of acknowledgement. And Saturdays can count. So, Holidays uh, don't. Sundays yeah. don't. A lot of times we get early CDs out so that we, the closer we get to closing, we can get our loan clear to close and just request our docs. So to Sundays don't, don't count for one of those days, and right. holidays. Holidays don't count. And Citywide can provide, we have trade calendars. So you yeah, guys yeah. can always get so, one uh, of those from us that will say, if they acknowledge it's the our, earliest they can sign, if they acknowledge, you know, we have them, I think, are they three months to print it out? I think we just got them for two Yeah, but they're always, I mean, it's really not rocket science. If they accept it on a Monday, as soon as you can sign it's a Thursday, they accept it on a Tuesday, it's Friday. But if they roll into the weekend, if they, they accept it on a Friday, as soon as you could, it's on Tuesday. As you it's know, already it's, Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I'm like, wait, oh, well. we were trained wrong, too, so, I mean. Yeah. Just, I would request a calendar. <laughs> yeah, <there's a> nice <laughs> they say holiday. Is that a good state holiday? That's no. It's just I don't think so. No, just probably, yeah, so the twenty fourth coming up. Probably. Well, in fact, count. that was on our email this morning that um, Penny mentioned about the CD. So you might want to look at that. It's That's usually good. when the stock market's closed. Yeah. yeah. But that, 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 that's so. funding. Uh, you know, one big advice, like I say, to reiterate, if you really need money received on a certain date for your seller to close on something, always try to give that extra day or two, um, kind of just in case some problems occur. Let's see, anything else, uh, any other things, concerns, you guys might have any questions for us? Go. Yes, we're good. Uh, I, I can't express though that finding a good lender is, is just, you know, especially I know if you were to ask Leslie how important a good lender is or any seasoned realtor, uh, getting that, finding that good lender that will take care of you uh, is really worth, worth a lot of time. So. Okay. I'd love to help you. Paul's back there as well. We're all, we're all out.
watchers with us also. Come on over and come. Or if you have those times where I know that, you know, like I say, it's all right if my member calls you. Uh, text me or come over and check or email me his, his number. Say, hey, will you call this guy? Usually I'll respond within, within 30 minutes or now. He's like, yeah, I'll get a hold of him and let him know what this week is. Okay, thanks for being here, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You can't believe that you talked to me. Uh, no.